By the end of this video, I'd like you to have a search pattern for a non-contrast head CT and basic spine studies, understand basic windows used to look at a head, and explain the practical applications of common MRI sequences. The search pattern I use is outside in. If at this point you don't really understand window and level, that's okay, but I outline it in the body lecture, which may be helpful to review. I start with the skin and soft tissues to help focus my attention inwards. I look at the scalp and orbits and soft tissues of the head. Then I go to bone windows, paying extra attention to areas underlying any soft tissue swelling I saw in the soft tissue window. Here I look for any fractures and look at the sinuses and the skull base. Then I use the general vein window, looking at the parenchyma in each hemisphere slash lobe. Finally, I look at fluid-filled structures in the brain, the ventricles and the cisterns. The gray-white preset is a narrow window to exaggerate the differences between gray and white matter. It can be a sensitive screen to look for a loss of gray-white differentiation. The blood window highlights blood in the skull. Here, notice blood in the inferior sagittal sinus stands out from the brain. This is helpful for looking for extra axial hemorrhages. Finally, only axial images are shown here, but I use all three reformats. Moving to MRI. MRI can be quite intimidating and confusing, but a detailed understanding of the physics is not required to begin to interpret images. Think of MRI sequences analogous to different stains in pathology. They each highlight different aspects but evaluate the same anatomy. MRI physics for now can be boiled down to patient goes into a magnet, radio waves happen, it goes into a computer, and you get an image. Unlike CT, however, most sequences are two-dimensional, not three-dimensional, meaning you need a separate acquisition for each orientation, coronal or axial, etc., rather than just reformatting. Here is a basic overview of what black and white mean on common MRI sequences. Regardless of what sequences, hyperintense will describe bright signal and hypointense will describe dark signal. This is a good site to look at for a while and digest. I'll talk through it. T1 is mainly used for anatomy. T1 hypointensity in the marrow usually indicates pathology, usually a marrow replacing process like infection or neoplasm. The five things that are bright on T1 are worth memorizing. I use a mnemonic. My best friend is pretty cool. T1 with contrast. In the brain, contrast makes areas of blood-brain barrier breakdown bright, and in the spine, it functions similar to CT contrast, that is, showing areas of increased vascularity and increased blood flow. T2 and related sequences are the main pathology identifying sequences. On classic T2 sequences, fat, fluid, and edema will be bright. Flare and stir are similar to T2, but with one of the three made dark. T2 star and related sequences, GRE and SWI, highlight inhomogeneities in the magnetic field, which will manifest as an area of decreased signal. These are hemosiderin, calcium, gas, and metal primarily. Here are multiple axial and one coronal images of the brain. In this T1-weighted sequence, the subcutaneous fat and the fat in the marrow is bright, but the fluid is dark and gray matter is darker than white matter. Here we see a mass in the right frontal lobe altering the local anatomy. With contrast, we see the mass is much brighter due to blood-brain barrier disruption. Also note that the superior sagittal sinus is bright as it is filled with contrast. On T2, the subcutaneous fat and marrow are still bright, but the fluid is bright as well. There are areas of increased signal near the mass, which may be fluid or edema. The coronal flare now shows increased signal near the mass persists while fluid in the ventricles is dark, making us think it's edema. T2 star shows focally decreased signal called blooming artifact, likely reflecting blood. This is a glioblastoma with internal hemorrhage and necrosis. For these sagittal images of the lower lumbar spine, it is similar. T1 shows us bright subcutaneous fat and marrow, but dark fluid in the central canal. L5 and S1, however, are abnormally dark, which indicates some sort of pathology. With contrast, the marrow and disc space will increase in intensity. On T2, the fluid 
in the central canal is now bright and the L5 S1 bodies and discs show slightly increased signal. On stir imaging, the normal vertebral bodies get darker, but the L5 S1 stay bright, indicating fluid and edema. This is L5 S1 discitis osteomyelitis. Diffusion weighting is an important tool in MRI, but can be very confusing. True diffusion restriction means that water cannot freely diffuse, which usually indicates an infarct in the brain or cord, pus, or highly cellular tumors, like lymphoma. The exact sequence to look at frustratingly varies by MRI manufacturer, but at OHSU at least, these are your options. As an internal control, any normal fluid-filled structure should be dark because water should be freely moving. If you see something bright on DWI, the next step is to check the diffusion map, which have a variety of names. Again, the ventricle should be bright here. If it is a true diffusion restriction, it will become dark. If it is still bright, it is called T2 shine through and not real diffusion restriction. On this example, we see hyperintensity in the right parietal lobe and the right periventricular white matter. Note that the ventricles are dark. On the ADC map, the corresponding area in the parietal lobe is dark, but the periventricular white matter is still bright. The parietal area is an infarct, and the periventricular hyperintensity is not. For spine studies, the search pattern is similar for the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. The template will help you. First, look at the alignment, then the vertebral bodies and the marrow, then move to the central canal, then look at the discs, and the foramina, and the facets, and the surrounding soft tissues. For lumbar spine terminology in particular, there are relatively strict definitions that, unfortunately, you need to memorize. It would be beyond the scope of this lecture to dive into nomenclature, but you need to know the nomenclature to be able to dictate lumbar spines intelligently. Here is a link to the document, which can be a bit overwhelming, but focus on the images and refer to the text as needed. Thank you.